Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And this is going to be part two of the games I've added to my collection in the first half of 2021. I'll have to figure out a shorter title. I'll figure it out. But either way, this is going to be part two. Part one up went yesterday. Part up. Part one went up yesterday. Uh, there are 36 games all together between the two lists. 18 on each, if I counted correctly. If I miscounted, then whatever. But just for some context, I said this yesterday's in the yesterday's video. But effectively, these are going to be games that I feel are likely to stick around for at least a year. Games I've played, I've enjoyed, I like them, and my first experience with them was in 2021, and I think they're going to be around for a while. And some that means some games are going to be games that I did play and may not have left the collection just yet, but aren't necessarily for me. Other times there are going to be games that I wouldn't be keeping except somebody else, like some particular kid games that I don't enjoy at all, if they're not really for me, but they're for my kids specifically, they may not, they may not be included either. Uh, lastly, what I will mention is, I said I'll do this yesterday, is in the last video I did, the one, well, six months ago for the games saying in my collection the second half of 2021, those games, just to cover some what I was wrong about in that sense, I thought Clank Legacy was going to be a game that I fully finished, and that's another caveat either a campaign game I fully finished or sticking around for at least a year. I thought Clank Legacy would be a game that I'd finished. I included that on my list. And sadly, we got like five missions in and we kind of called it a wraps on Clank Legacy. We weren't enjoying it enough to keep going through it just for the sake of finishing it. So I was wrong there. Additionally, Either Fields is still in my collection, but I do keep giving it the eye. It's, it's behind me somewhere over there. It's one that I do keep giving the eye. I really want to finish the rest of the campaign. I really want to go through more content, but also I have a lot of games I'm constantly trying to table, and compared to Isis Vanguard, I'd rather play as Isis Vanguard. So either Fields isn't gone yet, but I don't know if it'll make it this next six months. We'll see. If I can table it, then I'll keep it around. If I can't, it may go away. In any case, starting off with number one. Number one is going to be Lords of Hellas. Speaking of Awakened Realms games, that one hasn't left, but we have another one coming in. Lords of Hellas is going to be a game that I reviewed just this past week on Saturday, so you can go ahead and check that out. There's also going to be Lords of Ragnarok coming to GameFound sometime soon. They don't have an official date. Lords of Hellas is going to be an area control game. I gave this one a 5 out of 5. I really enjoy area control as a genre. I would say most area control games I have played fall into the range of either 4s or 5s. The problem is... It's such a competitive space for me in my collection that the fours tend to not stick around. Most fours will stick in my collection, but not if there are other games I'd rather play in that spot. Uh, Lords of Hellas is excellent. I love it. It's going to join me right up there at the ranks of, of we have Lords of Hellas, we have uh, Cyclades, we have Inish, we have Blood Rage, we have Chaos in the Old World. Lots of amazing games that are just delightful to play, and Lords of Hellas very much falls into that category. I enjoy this one, and it is sticking around. Well, that's not entirely true because Lords of Ragnarok might replace it, but I don't imagine I'm getting rid of Lords of Hellas before I get Lords of Ragnarok, so it's probably safe for a year. Number two. Number two, which should have been number one, but I forgot because it's not present in front of me. Number two is going to be a game called Arma. Arma is another game that I had a chance to review. It is a Kickstarter that barely funded. It's basically for a Crokinole competitor. Not competitor, but the same vein. It's a flicking game where you're going to flick discs around the track. It's a game where I literally watched the creator. The creator sent me the game when he wanted, uh, you know, when he wanted me to cover it. And I said, hey, it looks okay, but I can't imagine wanting to keep this over Crokinole. If you want me to cover it, I'm happy to cover it, but I just, that's my instinctive impression. And yet it is ridiculously fun and so, it's so engaging. It, it is in my collection. I'm very happy I have a copy because it's expensive. It's not cheap. I don't know if I'd pay for it. Full transparency. I don't know if I'd pay the, like, the $400 or cost for a board once you factor in shipping and this and that. It's not a small amount of money. That said, I really am enjoying it. Uh, Crokinole and Arma are games that I don't pull out often. But when I do, they provide great table fun for everyone involved. And in the case of Arma, more so because Arma is more of a two-player game, you often have people watching, wanting their turn because they're like, no, no, I can do it. I can do it. And they just get caught up in the flicking of the game. I have a playthrough with my wife. I do recommend watching it. It's, it's, I don't, I don't even know how, how easy it is to get the game. So maybe don't waste your time. I don't know. But it is a game that I thoroughly enjoy. Next up, in no particular order is this entire list, we have Winter Kingdom. Winter Kingdom from Queen Games. This is going to be a game that replaced Kingdom and Builder for me. I don't have space for both in my collection. They both do the same thing too similarly. I would say Kingdom Builder is a game that I li like a lot. It's a game that once upon a time was a five for me. I enjoy the variability of Kingdom Builder, but I've also had it in my collection since 2013, I want to say. Maybe 2012 even. And so it's a game that I've occasionally been looking at and wondering if it'll stay and how much longer because I like it. 
but I have complaints and issues. And I would say Winter Kingdom addresses most of those issues in a way that I consider an overall improvement to the game system. I did a play this, not that, of Winter Kingdom versus Kingdom Builder. They're both great games. I would give them the same ranking. They're both fours for me. They're both enjoyable. But I think Winter Kingdom just cleans up some some dry spots of, of Kingdom Builder. And it's a game that I have found, more importantly, it's a game that I have found others more willing to play Winter Kingdom than they have Kingdom Builder. And then we have Merchants of Magic. Merchants of Magic is a delightful game. I actually just watched Tom Vassal review this one. I reviewed this with Rena. We both gave this a four to five. I watched Tom's review. Tom's review is he likes the game mechanisms, but he finds that the luck of the draw can be hugely impactful in terms of if you've built up a system and then you draw certain cards that reward you for that system, you can just win the game just on sheer luck. He's not wrong. He's completely dead on. We talked about this in our review. We said what you can see not liking, and we talked about the luck aspect of the game, what we can see others not liking. I enjoy it despite that. This is not a game I go into with the expectation that I have to win. It's an ex I don't, I don't mean that to be mean to Tom. I'm saying it's just not what I'm, I'm playing this with my wife. I enjoy playing this. It's fun. We like going through the system, building up our little shops, developing what we're good at and not good at. And then yes, absolutely luck of the draw can be a game breaking aspect of the game. But this is for me from Rock Banner Games. I really enjoy this one. Uh, yeah, Merchants of Magic. Next up, we have Bytes, and many of these games, by the way, are going to be foreshadowing of reviews I plan on getting to. The sad reality, or happy reality, I guess depends on how you look at it, is there's only so many reviews I can actually put out a week. I play more games than I do review, and, and I have a backlog of games I want to do reviews on, including Bytes. And Bytes is a game that, well, I haven't gotten to review it yet, but I do plan on doing so, like I said already. This is going to be from... from board game tables. And Bytes, I really enjoyed this one. This is going to be a re-implementation of a game called... I don't remember what it's called. This is going to be a re-implementation of an original game. Big something? I don't remember. I don't remember what it was. Big points? Maybe it was big points? Whatever it was. Bytes is going to be a re-implementation, but adding variable scoring and variable aspects to the game. It took a an abstract game engine and then added layers to the top of that abstract game engine. Layers that apparently, according to the ants, are delicious to eat. This is going to be a game where you're managing your ants as they crawl around a trail. You're trying to balance how you score points in this game and how you move forward. I enjoy the variability. I enjoy the simplicity. Uh, Bytes is fun. Record from board game tables. I highly recommend that one. We're going to have the Whatnot Cabinet. Speaking of games, I need to review. The Whatnot Cabinet is going to be from Pencil First Games. This is one, oh my gosh, I I, I've just been backlogged with Kickstarter content that has like firm dates and I keep pushing off other reviews and Whatnot Cabinet is definitely one of those. I've played this with my daughter. I played this with my wife. It is absolutely enjoyable. It's it's a lot of fun. Maybe I'll do a playthrough. Maybe I'll do a playthrough interview. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But either way, the Whatnot Cabinet is going to be a set collection game, which is very common for many of these pencil first games, but it does so differently, which they all do something differently. Uh, you're going to be trying to collect various things into your Whatnot Cabinet, and you're going to be scoring for rows and columns and variable scoring objectives. Uh, like many other games, it's light, it's simple, it's to the point, it does a good job, beautiful artwork, Whatnot Cabinet. Next up, we have Asonia. Another game I'm meaning to review. Asonia is going to be a game from, 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 we should know who this is from, from Shard Hunters. Nope, it's not from them. It's from Lycan, Lycan Studio. That's who it was. Asonia is going to be a deck builder. This game completely fired, uh, Star, Star, Star Realms and Shards of Infinity for me. Although Star Realms was fired by Shards of Infinity, Shards of Infinity was fired by Asonia. And it doesn't mean a game has to fire each other, but I find these lighter deck building games that are very good at two player and a little bit worse at higher player counts. I find I don't have room for that many in my collection just in terms of playtime. And Asonia, with its focus on, well, I mean, all these games focus on interweaving cards and how the cards will play off each other in different ways, but Asonia focuses more on the building up of your points, and I really like, as opposed to the tearing down of others' health, so I like that aspect already, you can tear down others' points, but it's more about building yourself up, which I appreciate more, but I would say more importantly, I love the gem system. They have this aspect in the game where you inherently weed your deck as you take basic gems out of your deck and put them in a tableau that gives you increasingly more currency to spend every round, so as the game progresses, your escalate you're powering up. You're going to go from getting the first half of the game, you're going to get maybe 20 points out of the 60 you need, maybe, maybe even less. You might get 15 points of the 60 you need in the first half of the game, and the second half of the game, you'll get a lot more. The game ramps up as you start building up to blow, and as you can do more and more each turn. I do have a plan on having a review of this coming at some point, a playthrough and review probably as well, because I like playing it, and so we'll see, but that's going to be a Sonya. Next up, we have Ecos First Continent, another AEG game, and this is another one that I need to review. You can see a trend here of, of a large backlog of games that I want to review. Uh, Ecos First Continent is going to be a game that is very reminiscent of Gods Love Dinosaurs, speaking of games I need to review. But Gods Love Dinosaurs, and while well, 
well, let's talk about that later. We're talking about Ecos right now. Ecos is going to be a game that Ecos First Continent is a game where you're building out a bit of a of a system over here. You have a, a landscape that you're building out, a shared landscape as opposed to in Gods of Dinosaurs. I should probably do a play that's not that between the two games. They have similarities. But either way, uh, this is going to be a game where you have the shared landscape and you're going to be gathering tons of cards. Cards that are all about just which cards will play off each other in which ways. You're going to have initial pre-game draft. You don't have to draft. I do recommend drafting. It's going to be more rewarding, especially if you like drafting. But the pre-game game draft is going to let you pick a cohesive set of cards that all work together kind of like seasons as well lots of game comparisons here but yeah, we're going to be trying to figure out. So you might have a card that, you know, gives you three points and then adds a certain type of animal to the landscape. But then you have another card that will give you points plus get you ex extra points for each one of those animals added to the landscape. But you're all working on a shared, shared landscape, which means the things other players do affect you in different ways. It's all about the combination of the cards you get, the combination of the cards you'll get in the pre-game draft, as well as as you go through the game. Again, it has a lot of similarities to Seasons 2. Seasons and Gods of Dinosaurs. Honestly, if Seasons and Gods of Dinosaurs had a baby, it would be called Ecos. And I like that baby a lot. That sounds like a weird sentence. Scratch that. We'll take that out. Next up, we have Black Rose Wars. Now, this one I have not had a review for yet because I need to play it more. It's not, it's not a lack of time on this one. It's not a lack of review space. It's a lack of playing this game more. Black Rose Wars is a game that is delightful, but I've also only played it like twice. I played it. Uh, I had two games of Black Rose Wars. Not enough to give a comprehensive review on this one, especially given the amount of ways this game can play out. Uh, so this is one that I want to play it more, but I currently am enjoying it and I anticipate it being around. Like like uh, Lords of Hellas, it may be fired by Black Rose Rebirth, which will be coming to Kickstarter soon. So once I get Black Rose Rebirth, I make no guarantees I'll keep Black Rose Wars. The miniatures are amazing. The cards are amazing. But the sheer amount of content I have, I don't know if I can justify owning both. I will simply never play that much content. Just It's just a fact. I will never play that much content. I can say that even about what I have, let alone getting more for the Black Rose Rebirth. So I imagine I'll only end up keeping one. I'll keep whichever one I prefer most. In general, when it comes to new games versus old, I think I generally have leaned, I don't know if that's true. I'd have to go through my collection and figure it out, but I, it's very often, like Terraforming Mars versus Ares Exhibition, I prefer Terraforming Mars. Black Plague versus Second Edition Zombicide, I prefer Black Plague. Uh, what else is there? Kemet versus Kemet Blood and Sand, I kept, Blood, I kept Kemet Blood and Sand. Those are going to be recent examples of new versus old games, but I'd have to go through my collection. I think usually I end up upgrading to new systems, but it depends on how much gameplay changes there are. I think the more gameplay changes there are, the less likely I am to upgrade. Like, Hemet Blood and Sand has very minimal gameplay changes. Either way, kind of a side tangent, but I th I'm a good mix, I think, of keeping the old versus keeping the new. It ultimately comes down to whatever whatever calls to me more. That's going to be Black Rose Wars. Next up, we have King of Twelve by Lucky Duck Games. Lucky Duck Games had Destinies on my last list, and this time they have King of Twelve. Uh, yes, last yes, meaning yesterday's video. King of Twelve is going to be a light game. This is a 3 out of 5 for me. I enjoy it. I do not love it, but it makes me it, it makes me laugh every time I play it. Literally, every time I play this game, it's just laughter, because what you're going to have is box on upside down. Of course it is. You're going to have basically players playing cards, but every time someone does something that's exactly the same as another opponent, it's going to result in those things being cancelled. And that can happen in a variety of ways. It can happen in the ability you play. If we play two of the same card, our cards don't happen. It can happen in the actual dice on the table that you're trying to manipulate to have the highest value. So again, if I have a 12 and you have a 12, which are the highest value, then we'll both lose and the person who has the four might win over the person who has the one left, something like that. So, And then as well as that, at the very end of the round, if you and I have the same number of points, then again we lose because that the, all, all, anything equal loses out. It's going to be something you've seen before in a game called Las Vegas, the idea that Equal means you go, you both leave and the person below you wins. But the combination of the way all those things play out in King of 12, honestly, I think King of 12 would probably find, uh, they, they have space. Las Vegas is going, Las Vegas is going to stay in my collection for a variety of reasons. The higher player count accommodation. Also, not everyone I've, pl I've, not everyone I've played King of 12 with has enjoyed it as much as I have. And so Las Vegas has a little bit more general appeal, I think. But I really like King of 12. Again, it's a simple game. I don't, I can't, I, it, it's good. I enjoy it. I would not lose sleep if it was gone. But every time I do play it, I, I like it. And so for right now, it fills that great filler slot in my collection. Next up, we have Bullet, a game that I have had the chance to review. See, some of these I actually do get to review. Uh, Bullet's going to be a game from Level 99 Games. It's going to be a, I think it's called a shmup. Shoot, shmup. Shoot him up. Is that, what, is that what shmup is? Shoot him up? I don't know what a shmup is, but I think that's what, it, I think that's what the term is. Shoot them up. 
That's what it is. A shoot them up is a shmup, I guess, maybe, I don't know. But bullet's going to be an arcade style game where you're basically dealing with the puzzle of, of you have these bullets kind of entering your grid and you're trying to send those bullets off by trying to collide them or set different patterns. You have unique players with unique variable powers. Again, I have a review if you want to see a full how-to and all that stuff. But the fun part is you can either do a solo, which I, I didn't like playing solo. Solo versus the boss I did like. And my favorite mode is playing it competitively. Ultimately, any form of solo play. And I think I'd rather play Under Falling Skies. Less chaotic, more planning, which is my preference. The, the random nature of having your planning go well and then just something random happen in a way that kind of ruins your planning. I don't love that in Bullet. Now, when you throw in the competitive play aspect where the bullets that I destroy get sent to your opponent, well, now we're talking a whole different ballpark. Now it's a whole different kind of game. And I really enjoy the competitive aspect of Bullet. Lots of fun to go through it. Like many games on this list, it's a game I need to play more often, but I really like Bullet from Level 99 Games. Next up, we have The Grand Carnival. Now, this one is a bit risky to put on this list because I'm actually not as certain as I should be about whether this stays in my collection long term or not. This is a game that was recommended to me as a game that is Baron Park, but better. And I understand why anyone would say that while not necessarily feeling that way myself. I need more plays of the game, to be very clear. The back won't show you much over here, unfortunately. I need more plays of the game because the game itself is a lot of fun. It has a polyomino aspect to the game. And one thing I really like, it has a little bit of an of a, like a Rollercoaster Tycoon aspect where you feel like you're building out your theme park. You're going to be building out various grids that are going to define both the pathways of your park as well as the building areas. And then on those building areas, you're building the polyomino tiles, which are the rides. And then you're sending guests and visitors through your park, trying to have them stop off as many rides and get various tickets and goals and all that. My biggest problem with the game is going to be a weird problem to have. Like I want an expansion for this game. I want an expansion a lot. And I will have a review coming or maybe a play that's not that with Baron Park. We'll see. But my biggest problem with the game is that I feel like my early games, I've scored too well. I think I'm playing it correctly. I've read the rules again. In general, I try to do that after a game. But I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm playing correctly, but I feel I score too well. Like, I don't feel like I'm struggling to try to get all the various points. I'm getting a lot of points in a lot of different ways, and there's going to be various goals as well. The various goals don't give you points like they do in Baron Park, but rather the various goals give you abilities, which I do like that. I like the unlocking of abilities in the game. But again, I, I, I just don't feel challenged enough by the game i mostly feel i have also i have one every game i've played which is unfortunate i don't love it when that happens it takes away from the challenge but i i, I want to play this more i feel like i really want an expansion for this game i want something that adds more variability or interesting things to the mix as of right now i enjoy the game but the reasons to keep playing it often come down to those ability cards it often comes down to seeing which new abilities are going to come out that again give me different ways or pathways to try to build out your your engine in this polyomino tile lane game really like it Long term, we'll see, but I think it, I think it will stick around. I wouldn't put it on this, on this list if I wasn't, if I didn't at least think it'll stick around, and that's why it's over here. That's gonna be the Grand Carnival. We got more to go through. We're gonna have Paleo. Paleo, a game that I recently put on my top 10 games of 2020 list. Paleo is a game that was definitely a surprise to me. I, I'm not, that's not true. I don't have to define a surprise. It's a game that I got because of the high praise for the game. I wouldn't have got this, well, the art looks great too. I, I am pulled in by the art. So Z-Man Games, Paleo, I spoiled them by the art, the high praise for it, but then it kind of sat on my shelf languishing, just unplayed, along with too many of its friends that don't get enough attention. And then Jeremy Howard mentioned this in a video and he said, oh, have you played Paleo to, to, to Jesse Anderson, to Quacklow? And I was like, you know what? Neither of them have played Paleo. I'll pull up Paleo and give that one a shot. And so I did. And I really like it. I actually played it with Quackloop. And both of us have been really enjoying going through it. It's a lot of fun. You're basically building out this uh, caveman, Neolithic civilization. And you're trying to overcome the various hazards that life throws at you. And hazards in this case isn't like my Wi-Fi stopped working. Although that is a nightmare, let's be honest. But rather, it's going to be what Sabertooth Tiger is attacking you. And I know which one, I know which one of those is worse. But let's be honest about which one sounds worse. Just no Wi-Fi. I don't want to think about it. Either way, once you overcome the no Wi-Fi card, the, the, the caveman, troll, whatever, uh, Sabertooth Tiger card, that's the one. Once you overcome the Sabertooth Tiger card, cards out of the deck, so you're going to have to give up life and resources and energy to deal with these hazards, but it makes for a cleaner deck. If you don't deal with them, then it slowly pings away with you and keeps coming back. It, it results in an interesting kind of reverse deck building challenge that's a lot of fun to go through. I really like Paleo. Uh, there's modules once you start getting the hang of it, so those modules give you another reason to keep diving back in. Really enjoying this one. Now, Next up, we have Antique, which is kind of a cheat because this is... I love Antique Duellum. Antique Duellum is a game that's been in my collection for a long time. It's a great two-player area control game. It's one, of the it's one of the few two-player area control games that I easily and heartily recommend. Whenever I say heartily, people ask if I said hardly. No, I heartily recommend. I should probably just stop using the word. It's safer. 
Antique is going to be, well, this timeline here, if I'm not mistaken, is we had Antique, which I never played. Then we had Antique Duellum, which is the two-player version using the Antique system. And then we have Antique 2, which is the iterated version of Antique taking some aspects of Duellum into the game. I, I think. I could be wrong with the timeline, but that's what I think the timeline is. What I can tell you is I've played Antique Duellum, and I love it, and it's still in my collection. And I've played Antique 2, and I love it, and it's staying in my collection. This was one that was on my shelf for a long time. The reason it was on my shelf for a long time is I got it because it was Antique Duellum, but with more players. That's great. And I never really played it because Antique Duellum is so good at what it does that I didn't think it would work as well with more players. And to a certain extent, it might not. The raw simplicity of the game. It's an area control game where you basically have a rondelle and you're going to be choosing different actions and everything you do, similar to games like Concordia from Matt Gertz, he has this general system in his games that everything you do is gets makes your system more powerful. So you want to do X so you can do Y more powerful. But if you do Y, X will be more powerful. Meanwhile, if you do Z, X will also be more powerful. So you're constantly trying to build up the sequence of the ways you grow more powerful in ways that are faster and better than other players. And Antique Duellum is raw and streamlined and simple and head-to-head. -head. Antique 2 does allow for the possibility of the way players making decisions can negatively impact your own experience of the game. In other words... I may feel like in Antique Duellum, it's simply a question of who did it better. There's like no luck in the game. It's who did it better. Uh, in Antique 2, I can easily make the argument that, oh, I had a really good engine, but then, you know, John attacked you when he clearly, John attacked me when he clearly should have attacked you because you were clearly the stronger player. And then you can feel frustrated with the fact that you built a better engine, but you got targeted by the wrong player. So it does allow for that possibility. That said, we're still enjoying it. And yes, we've had debates about how the fact that, you know, that person should have attacked that person. We have absolutely had those debates when playing this game, but I still really enjoy it. And I would argue that the social element of having more players at the table does overcome the slight decrease in the gameplay experience that it provides. That's going to be Antique 2. Then we have Fairy Tale, or Fairy Tale Inn more specifically. This is going to be a command game that is light and fun and simple. Fairy Tale Inn is one that, this one I kind of question its longevity, but I think it'll stick around for at least a year. It really needs more characters in the box, which is something that others have said, and I think it's true. This is basically going to be Connect 4, the d designer game version of the game. Uh, you're going to have a little kind of grid, and you're literally dropping tiles into that grid. The difference is, unlike Connect 4, you're not trying to connect a pattern of 4. Rather, you're playing with different uh, tiles with abilities, and how I place my tiles here this happens if you place your tile there that happens and it's the way you place those tiles down into this grid for both in-game and end-game scoring that result in an interesting puzzle that takes something very familiar and makes it different this is a great game in the sense that if you have children if you have kids if you have people who are going to result like, like a common problem i have with my kids is my daughter loves many of the gamer games we play but then she has friends who know Monopoly. So she's not a snob, fortunately. I'm a bit of a snob. She's not as much of a snob. She plays Monopoly. She enjoys it. But the question is, you have your friends who won't know anything about these designer games, and they don't know what they're getting themselves into. You throw Fairy Tale in down in front of somebody, they're going to play it. It's a, it's a quick and simple, easy, fun game that you throw it down in front of a non-gamer child who is used to Connect 4 and has just played Monopoly with your kid or your kids play Monopoly with them, whatever it is. Fairy Tale Inn is appealing. My daughter has successfully played this with a bunch of her non-gamer friends and they like it. It's pulling them in because it's something familiar with Fairy Tale characters, which are familiar, combined into a game system. I, come on... This is not my favorite game from you by a long shot, but this may have been one of the best things you've ever done for the general gaming space. That and all the Zombicide, of course. Yeah. Anyways, we're going to have next up is going to be Viticulture. I'm leaning further and further down as I realize that I set things on the floor because I don't have enough space to put stuff. This is going to be Viticulture. Viticulture by Stonemaier Games, a game that I need to review. I will have a review coming on this one at some point soon. Let's see how far we can push this before things fall off the table. That looks good over there. Uh, Viticulture. Viticulture, to which I've already deluxified this game fully. I know there's more content for this game coming. There's some sort of expansion at some point. I don't know. I already have Tuscany bundled inside of here. Don't worry. Yes, I play it with Tuscany. No, I don't consider it as essential as others do. I don't think I'd ever play it without it because it improves stuff. But like people talk about Tuscany like it's the thing that fixed Viticulture. I, not for me. I like Viticulture just fine as is. Tuscany is better. It's definitely better. But either way, Tuscany and Viticulture are going to be a worker placement game that's all about the cards. It's all about the cards. I love the powers and abilities that the game provides. I like the worker placement that the game provides. It provides a tense, a seasonal-based worker placement. So across one round, you're going to be placing workers in different spheres to try to basically take advantage of different seasons. So you have one round, then one round, then one round, then one round. Or if you're playing original Viticulture, then just two rounds, two seasons. But it's a puzzle of a game with tons of cards. 
as you try to build up your wine, basically the whole goal of the game is to get points. Most of those points are going to come through the creation of your wine. You're going to get grapes, you're going to harvest those grapes, you're going to turn those grapes into wine, and then fulfill various wine orders. That's going to be the bulk of the way you get points. But along the way, there's a lot of other peripheral things that will give you points in the game, and it's a fun little engine of amazing card play. I will have a review at some point. I absolutely need to. I told my patrons I would a while ago. Like I said, it's just been uh, backlogged on lots of other content. Next up, we have a game that I have reviewed, which is going to be After the Empire. After the Empire. Again, we're running out of space here. I'm going to push this one off to the side over here. And After the Empire. After the Empire is going to be by Gray Fox Games. This is delightful. Uh, this is another one where it's a little long. It's a little messy, but I like it past that. The, the core game engine comes down ultimately to defending your, your, your towers, your castles from the invading hordes. Every single round, you're going to have more and more invaders coming, and then you're going to have the worker placement phase where you upgrade your tableau and upgrade your castle. You're doing both. So it's a combination of every round. You're like, ooh, I'll take that card because then I'll be stronger every round. But I also have to spend time, resources, and energy improving my castle so that I don't die this round. So it's going to be a constant balance of when you spend time, energy, and attention to upgrade things versus when you spend time, energy, and attention to to, to just make sure you stay alive in this game. This is a game where you can make it to the end of the seventh round, having never ever been sacked, or you can make it to the end of the seventh round, having been sacked multiple times. Depends how you play, or you may even be fine with being sacked intentionally because the early game you may not you may you may not pay as much of a penalty in points early game. It might be worth it. Uh, overall, this is a great one. This has the chaos of Galaxy Trucker, but in a game system that I prefer. And then lastly, we're really truly running out of space here, so we're gonna just again just put this on the floor. Lastly on this list, we started with an Awaken Realms game. We are going to end with an Awaken Realms game. This is another one that I need to have a review for, but this is because I don't have a review for this one because. I've literally just played this for the first time. I have three plays under my belt, uh, one yesterday and two the day before, and they're all solo co-op. I need to play it competitively before I have a review for this game, but I can tell you that I've already sleeved this game and it's going to be added to my collection. Now, some of that's going to be biased by the fact that I recently got rid of Rising Sun, a game that my uh, generally, my, my, one of my children loves ninjas and samurai and China and the Great Wall, and I know different cultures and all that, but the combination, he loves that whole, the whole world. And so I got rid of Rising Sun, he was sad about that, and so now he has the Great Wall. And no, that's not the only reason I'm keeping it, but it certainly is a small bias toward it in its favor. Uh, the Great Wall, I'll have a review on this one coming at some point once I play it competitively, but effectively, there's a very short version, is this falls exactly into Awakened Realm's usual wheelhouse for me, which is, I have a lot of complaints and things like, like I feel, it's so interesting. Awakened Realms is a company, I generally feel their games are very unique, they're very ambitious, they do a lot of things, and they're fun. I like their games. And yet the rule book, it's not the worst rule book I've ever read, but it could be so much better. Uh, the board is unnecessarily large, not too large, unnecessarily large. There's a big distinction between those two things. Uh, some of the game mechanics, and this is a little trickier, some of the game mechanics don't mesh as cohesively as I would like, and stuff like that. Again, I like the game. The tableau building is immensely rewarding. The basic idea of the game is going to be worker placement, tableau building, tower defense. So worker placement, you're going to be putting down your clerics to various areas to get various things. Similar to the Great Wall, similar to After the Empire, you're trying to simultaneously survive the current round while building up your tableau. This would make for a great play This not that. Interesting. I need to think about that. I might do a play this, not that, on The Great Wall and After the Empire. Intriguing idea. That is neither here nor there. The point is that The Great Wall gives you worker placement, uh, tower defense, and tableau building, no different than After the Empire. But what it comes down to in this one is the, the tableau building is immensely rewarding. The art is gorgeous. The worker placement is a lot of fun. The tower defense feels a little abstracted and not quite as immersive as I would like. Uh, overall, I really enjoy The Great Wall. It's staying in my collection. I, I don't know how I feel about competitive play until I play it competitively, but I can tell you that I already like this game, and that's enough for me to be pretty sure that it's sticking around for quite some time. That has been your, your list. These are going to be 36 total games, 18 here, 18 yesterday, of the games that are being added to my collection in the first half of 2021. I play a lot of games, and every single month, like 10 games leave my collection, and it looks like only 36 got added, technically... Maybe, sort of. That said, I get rid of games that like this big, and then I get things like Great Wall, which take up an entire Calyx cubby, so the space in this basement is not getting better, even if the game count is remaining pretty stable. Until next time, I am Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, have a good one.